Welcome to another episode of the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast. I'm Anthony Kazenza, and I'm joined, as usual, by my co-host, John Sheeran. John, are you are your nerves shot yet? I mean, we're we're sitting over here on pins and needles about this coaching coaching search, and it uh, seems like the, the Bengals are taking their sweet time on this thing. We'll talk a little bit about it, but how you doing, buddy? The last domino, I guess. But um, I'm I'm pretty comfortable right now. I'm back at UC, wearing my UC jersey to celebrate okay. their military bowl win. I didn't have this last week, so I'm I'm making up for it now for our UC in the in the audience at the moment. But yeah, um, the the, the more that we wait, that you know, it's it, it's like that. It's like a double edged sword, I guess, because the more that they wait, you know, there's logic in not being an internal candidate. But the more that you wait and are thinking about you know, a fear that you have, the more that you think it actually is going to happen. So it's kind of like this balancing act that we're all kind of dealing with right now. And we just kind of want to get it over with, but you know, the, the, they're taking their sweet time with this. And I guess that's just the way that they do things. Yeah. And for once the, the Cincinnati Bengals are kind of being a little sneaky and kind of have the attention of the national landscape. Cause like you said, most of those jobs are filled up now. So it's kind of an, a rare position that all of us are in and that the Bengals are in and that a lot of eyes are on them right now. Oh, for sure. And like, you know, the, the good thing for them is that, you know, I think they, they seem to have a plan about what guys that they interviewed and if they can get away with maybe not hiring them off the spot because you know, on the list of the interview uh, of the three, you know, of the four external candidates, three of them are on team are on teams that had the first round by, but, you know, two of them were on the in, on the NFC team. One of them was on the AFC team. So it's almost like they had they could have a situation where it could be kind of like the Colts last year, where they were rumored to have you know McDaniel's be be their coach, but obviously he couldn't do anything or announce anything until the Patriots went out of the playoffs, and then they ended up you know going to the Super Bowl, losing the Super Bowl, and then McDaniel's was like announced as their head coach, and then he obviously backed down, went back to the Patriots, and they're like. What, what are we gonna do? We're, we're SOL, but as it, as it so happens, there's another candidate on the, the team that beat them in the Super Bowl, and Frank Reich, that ended up, be, you know, obviously joining the Colts, and the rest is history for them. So, in, in terms of like their candidates that they have significant interest in, who we, you know, you you and I, and most of the guys at Cincy Jungle may think are the favorites, you know, th- those guys could be end up, end up coaching in the Super Bowl, and they don't have the right to announce, you know, them as the head coaches they're hiring, and they and those coaches don't have the right to, you know abandoned everything that's going on there and, and going over to Cincinnati. So it could be a situation where we could we could be actually just waiting up until the Super Bowl because the candidate is going all those ways and the other candidates that are still in play are could be playing on the other side of it. So, you know, I, I think at this point they're going to be the last hire that is announced and I think it's going to be from one of those two teams. Yeah, the Bengals are waiting it out and uh, there are, like you said, a handful of guys that um, – have interviewed a handful of guys that uh, they that they feel are worthy of the position. Just to recap of who the Bengals, before we, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff tonight. We're going to talk about um, not only who the Bengals have interviewed, we're going to talk about a potential dark horse guy. And if that is a good idea or a bad idea to pursue this certain individual, um, we'll, we'll talk about a number of different things. We're going to play a fun little game, kind of using one word to describe these head coaching candidates and uh, their style and their fit with the Bengals, whether it's positive or negative. Um, and then we'll be taking your questions and all of that. We do have a special announcement that we'll, we're going to be making in just a second here, but um, that's, we've got a lot on tap. We're going to take your questions if we can towards the end of the program. We've already got text messages. We've already had calls come in before the show even started. So uh, we, we appreciate the enthusiasm. We're going to try and get to as many of those as possible. You can get in touch with us uh, through the live YouTube chat that we're running uh, in the live recording of this show. You can also call or text us on the uh, the OBI line, 949-542-6241. We'll try and get to those uh, as much as we can throughout the show. Um, so, so send those our way. And if you're new to the show and are catching it after we, we record live, we, we do record live on YouTube and on through CincyJungle.com. You can access the show. You can also get it uh, on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Google Play, on Art19, and then all of our stuff's on YouTube as well. So uh, grab that as you can. Uh, uh, I've a little bit deeper into the coaching stuff, John. I, I do want to have a special announcement that to, to kind of kickstart the show. Um, 
we asked a couple of weeks ago through a, a Twitter poll and, and some other things, we asked our listeners, you know, what would you like to see from us in the new year? What more would you like to see from us in um, the, the area that seemed to have had the most votes is hearing from Bengals players. Well, we've, we've really tried to make that an endeavor, you know, as last season we had Anthony Munoz and Willie Anderson to talk, uh, to, to talk with us about the Bengals as the season started. Um, that was exciting. And then as we got going in the season, we kind of had some guests from the other side of the fence, opponents, uh, opponent bloggers and whatnot. Um, I am excited to announce that later this week, and next week, we have a couple of current Bengals players that will be joining us for interviews. Now, it won't be when we usually record the show live because their schedules did not permit to come on that. But th- it, these interviews will be on the feed. They'll be on CincyJungle.com. They'll be on all of our channels to look out for them. The first one we're going to do is actually with wide receiver Tyler Boyd. Um, and he is going to be brought to us by, uh, by Vizio and all of their great products that Vizio makes. So uh, we'll be talking with him later this week. Wide receiver Tyler Boyd on his near Pro Bowl type of campaign this year is breakout season in 2018. Very excited to have him on the on the show and and in our uh, in our Rolodex, I guess, if you will, of of players. And then we will also will be talking with uh, running back Mark Walton next week. Uh, so keep your eyes open for those. We'll still have our normal show that we usually do weekly. Uh, we'll try and add those into the, sh- the show as we uh, as we go forward, but those will be coming up over the next calendar week or so. So keep your eyes out. We'll be we'll be joined by Tyler Boyd and uh, again from Vizio from brought to us by Vizio and Mark Walton is brought to us by Panini, who makes the uh, the trading card the trading card company the, the the kind of sticker trading cards. If you're if you're an old school card collector, you probably know those. So uh, very excited to be having those and and bring you their interviews and their insight. Uh, probably a lot to talk about with them, given the coaching stuff that's going on too. So check that out. We're pretty excited about it, and uh, should be should be a good couple of sound clips for you. Wait, so are we getting Vizio TVs for this? I wish. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> uh, they make good. They make good stuff, man. They make good stuff, and uh, I, I was not. I was not offered a Vizio TV. I can. Uh, I can tell you that. I think Mr. Boyd might be getting a Vizio TV, probably, I'm or sure some product. Yeah, yeah, he probably does. But uh, they reached out to us, and um, you know, he's doing some stuff with them, and uh, we want to. We want to promote what he's doing with them and also just talk with them, catch up with them as well as Mark Walton and, and uh, Panini. Mark Walton's actually going to be at the NFL PA bowl. Um, so that's where we're going to be speaking with him. He's making an appearance this, that next weekend at that scouting event. So that's uh, that, that'll be interesting to talk to him as well. So pretty excited about both those opportunities and bring those, bring those guests to you guys. So keep your eyes and ears open for that. Back to the coaching search though, John. I'm, I'm, I'm still getting some texts and whatnot right now. Let, let's let's kind of run down the list of interviewee, interviewers or interviewees, I guess, that the Bengals have brought in. Uh, but Internally, it's been and, – and please tell me if I forget someone, John. Uh, Bill Lazor, Hugh Jackson. Not, he's kind of an outside guy, outside guy. He's kind of an inside guy. Vance Joseph. Uh, Darren Simmons as well. Those are those are the inside guys, I believe, that they've interviewed. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, Joseph kind of flirts with that that line there. What's we'll, we'll um, inside guy though? For yeah, all. yeah, I, I think I think we should. I think you're right about that. Outside, Todd Monken, the Buccaneers, a former Buccaneers offensive coordinator. I don't think he's actually with them anymore. He's kind of a free agent coach, if you will. Uh, kind of an emerging name out there. Shane Waldron, uh, an offensive assistant with the with the Los Angeles Rams. That's still weird to say, LA Rams for me. I just <laughs> it's just weird for me to say. Uh, I know uh, Zach Zach Taylor, another offensive assistant quarter. I think he's the quarterbacks coach uh, with the Los Angeles Rams. So those guys, Eric Bieniemy, also uh, interviewed, and I am missing. Who that's, who it, that's, I it. that's it. Okay, that's it. Yeah. Okay, so those are the guys. We're gonna we're gonna play a fun game with those guys in just a little bit. But those are the guys that we know the Bengals have interviewed, right? Um, I, you mentioned this. I just want you to expand on this, John, because we received a couple of uh, – the first text message we got about um, 
the, the coaching search is basically, I, I don't know who this, uh, who this person is. Unfortunately, it's a 419 area code. Uh, do you think the Bengals hire B enemy or Monken? He, uh, this person obviously thinks that the Bengals have narrowed their search down to, to one of those guys you mentioned. And I think it's worth noting, John, that it's very possible that the Bengals are holding off on an announcement of a coach because one of their coaches is, their team is still eligible in the playoffs right now. Right. So uh, your thoughts on the enemy versus Monken and, and expand on that, which you mentioned a little earlier about, you know, the Bengals may be holding off because of uh, league rules on announcing one of those guys. And if you think that that's the main reason why they haven't announced anybody yet. Right. So the enemy's interview was, I think, Saturday of last week, and then Monkin was interviewed Monday. Monkin was kind of like a late announcement for them, and I think he ended up yeah. being the last guy interviewed. And I don't know if they scheduled that interview um, just around or maybe just after they they interviewed Taylor and the enemy, and maybe they got a sense that, okay, one of those guys is probably going to be our guy, but let's go ahead and, you know, we already scheduled an interview with Monkin. Let's go ahead and see what he has to offer. But, you know, w- w- with the report from uh, Paul Denner Jr. Coming, coming from Cincinnati.com today that they were done interviewing candidates and that they're keeping, obviously, all the information b- between the four-person team of Mike Brown, uh, Paul Brown, his grandson, the Blackburns, and I guess Duke Tobin, the, 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 just the small group that's been in this interview process. You know, they're keeping all the information behind closed doors. But it appears that they're done interviewing guys. And when you compare Biennemi and Monken, I guess, it, it, I, I, I guess it just depends on what you're willing to bet on in terms of just the positives in their resume with the enemy. You're coming from the, the Andy Reid coaching tree, which in recent years has had major success. Obviously, you can look at this, the Chiefs offensive explosion this year with Patrick Mahomes, a quarterback, and just the array of weapons that the Chiefs have on that offense and how the enemy hasn't called the plays, but he has been, you know, Andy Reid's right-hand man in terms of game planning and and in-game management, just developing those guys on offense to elevating their games to a whole other level. And then you have Monken, who, in my opinion, has an even more impressive resume and and past experiences with taking over a Southern Miss football team back in the early 2010s, going from, I think, a winless season in in 2012 and in just three short years, raising them to to a 9-5 record, one of the very best offenses uh, just in college football period, and ended up developing quite a number of NFL talents or NFL uh, future NFL players like Nick Mullins and Ido Smith and even Mike Thomas, who plays for the Rams. And then Monken got his opportunity to go to the NFL, and in three three years with the Buccaneers, he ended up you know producing a solid passing attack with that with that group. And obviously, like the Chiefs, they have a lot of dangerous weapons on the outside. But you know, Jameis Winston isn't exactly what Patrick Mahomes is now, so. <laughs> and, and, and that running game and offensive line is a little bit less in, in, in comparison as well. But I think with right. what Monken had to work with in Tampa Bay, I think relative to what the enemy had and the fact that Monken actually designed the offense and ended up calling plays, I think his resume is a little bit more impressive and, and just his overall just line of or just overall past experience is a little bit better in my, in my book. But I think that in their eyes, the enemy might be the guy because, you know, he, was with the organization before that, you know, they like having him worked under uh, Andy Reid's probably a bigger positive than Monken and kind of just made his own way. But, you know, the enemies you know, had a lot of positive experiences as well since he entered the coaching ranks in the early two thousands going up from Colorado as a running back coach. And then I think he had a stem with the Vikings and then ended up going to Andy Reid. And, you know, he, this is his first year being an offensive coordinator, but obviously the results speak for themselves and how impressive they are. And I think the enemy also, because like, just today, I think he spoke with the media about uh, preparing for the Colts and just just gauging his personality from the interview. I think it really spoke to me as a guy who could win over Mike Brown w- 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 with some charm of his own and kind of reminded me a little bit of Hugh Jackson, I guess, and just the way that he spoke about his players and how you know he's preparing those guys and just speaking highly of them. The positives, I guess, of Hugh Jackson when you know when you know, when he was considered once a good coach, I think that kind of resonates to what a guy that Mike Brown might like and might want trust and handing over power. And I think that might've spoke a lot in his interview as well. So me, me personally, just based off what I know, I would prefer Monken. I'm not saying that the is a bad candidate at all, but um, if I had to choose between one of them, I would choose Monken, but I definitely understand mm-hmm. the reasoning behind choosing the And I think that he's a quality candidate as well. Well, look, here, there, there's two schools of thought with both of those guys, right? I mean, you look at Monken and you say, okay, look, look what he did in Tampa Bay because 
you had Mike Evans, that's your AJ Green, right? He had Deshaun Jackson, who you know you could say that's John Ross. He can do. Uh, he, and they had. Uh, I know you scoff at it, but skill skill set wise, you you know you got yet. you've got the, the speedy guy, you know. And they had uh, Godwin that kind of worked the slot a little bit, and you've got that guy in Boyd. So he's got that trio of guys. He's got a more talented stable of running backs, I would think, in terms of Mixon, Bernard, Walton. Those guys, uh, you know, lined up for him right now. But then you have Biennemi, who comes from the – he has this Andy Reid system where backs and multiple backs are very versatile and can, and can do a lot of different things. The three guys I just mentioned – uh, would probably be salivating at the enemy coming coming over here, especially being a former running back himself. So they would probably be just stoked about that. Uh, and then you've got the Tyreek Hill. Can can he use John Ross in the Tyreek Hill type of role potentially? Um, you know, there's all that kind of stuff. There's the pass catching tight end and Kelsey that the Bengals maybe could go after a pass catching tight end, whether that's Eifert or somebody else. So there's a lot of correlations there where you say either one of those guys could theoretically, you would hope, come in and really use a lot of the pieces that are here already, maybe add a few things in terms of the offensive line, linebackers, and do, do that kind of stuff on the, on the periphery in terms of free agency in the draft, but really work and rework a game plan with who, who's here. So I, I find both of those guys interesting. I guess just from a more popular name standpoint and the fact that their team was their team was great this year and their offense was great this year i guess i lean a little bit heavier to to be enemy but um as i as i read and hear more about monk and i i am uh, i am impressed with that and that's that's an interesting one my uh, that i also think is um is we uh, should not be scoffed at you know i think that's that's a that's a decent that would be a decent hire for this team if that's the route they went now i want to ask you this John. Now, they interviewed Bill Lazor for the head coaching job mm-hmm. last last year, along with Marvin Lewis. Lazor signed a two year deal with the club to be their offensive coordinator. So he should be, unless I'm I'm missing something here. He should be the guy. At least he should be their offensive coordinator under contract this year. Uh, do you think that some of these guys they brought in were, yeah, we'll interview for the head coaching job, but they have an open opening at defensive coordinator. They may look at some of these guys for other positions. Do you think that one of these guys may also come in that they've interviewed as, you know, maybe a Vance Joseph interviewed for the head coaching spot, but he comes in as the defensive coordinator. Do you think that maybe a couple of these guys end up coming here that they've interviewed one in an assistant capacity? Yeah, I think Monken is a possibility just to be Mm. as a coordinator because what was interesting is that after the interview Monday, he like he there was rumors that he could be the Jets guy, but after that, it was just a few uh, interviews to be off the score. I think Jackson was one of them. Uh, With the whole Rams situation with Zach Taylor and Waldron, I think there was some talk about how Waldron would become Taylor's offensive coordinator if Taylor were to take this job, right. or, or if they were just in, interested in Waldron as an offensive coordinator and kind of labeled it as a head coach or whatever. I don't know if it did that or, or, or not, but I think that could have been a, a plan with, with bringing both of those guys over there to kind of keep the continuity between the two of them. But, um, but, 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 but yeah, like, like Joseph definitely could have been like talked about as a defensive coordinator. And I think that, you know, had had they hired you know just as a defense coordinator, it was it would have been very likely that one of the candidates would w- would be maybe informed that that was possibly a plan that they that they would be you know supportive of because who knows if one of these guys is, is going to be able to bring in their ent- an, an entire new staff for them because they do have that opening at defensive coordinator. Bill Lazor is still technically the offensive coordinator, but who knows if you know if they're planning on actually bringing an offensive guy. Is he going to have full control of that offense, or is Bill Lazor still going to be the one calling the plays? And he's and the new head coach is just going to act as a traditional head coach and not have play calling duties on either side of the ball. We still don't know who, who that defense coordinator is. It's easy to say that Vance is like the favorite because he's the one that's been linked to the most out of the guys that they interviewed and the guys that they looked at so far. But it'll, it'll be interesting to see, you know, wh- which guy that they, that they bring in, how much power he has over. The, you know the, the rest of the staff and how much overhaul there is over that staff but i do definitely think that there were some possibilities with some of the guys that they interviewed 
that could just be for assistance down the road if they get the right hire. And I, and I guess the one that I didn't mention, which is the one I don't want to mention, is Hugh Jackson. It's always possible he could be promoted to the laser spot at the office coordinator, depending on, again, who they hire. And I guess Vance is like the popular one with that combination. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would not be surprised to see multiple interviewees come in for spots. I, I just, I, I wouldn't be surprised now that may be, you know, how you may sell that to some of these guys is that, you know, either you're unemployed or you, you're not getting interviews elsewhere, or this could be even a one or two year stepping stone for you into a head coaching gig. If you take this assistant, you know, the assistant level, yes, you interviewed for a head coaching spot, but now on your resume, you interviewed for a head coaching spot. You got a promotion, say, if you're, um, if you're Waldron or Taylor to an offensive coordinator spot, and then you can springboard into a head coaching job, you know, from there. But, um, I don't know. I, I would not be surprised to see uh, a couple of these guys come through and uh, and land here in Cincinnati. And obviously, like you said, it depends on who gets that head coaching spot. Obviously, though, Cincinnati has an opening at the defensive coordinator spot, so they will. Uh, you know, they'll need that. That for sure will need to be filled. Um, mm-hmm. You know, they may hang on to Laser. He's under contract. They may hang on to him just you know if they if they give. The Dalton, the you know the bridge here, if you will, um, and, and some of these other guys, kind of just to get a little bit of continuity in a in a year of a lot of upheaval. Maybe they do that, but uh, that that remains to be seen. This is the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast. He's John Sheeran. I'm Anthony Cazenza. We're talking about the Bengals coaching search, their interviews, and all kinds of fun things. We're going to get to a a fun game in a second, but before we do that. Uh, we're going to have a little debate uh, about a couple of dark horses um, that not a lot of people are talking about, but I think they might be worth a mention. We'll, we'll, we'll see. But you can get this show on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Google Play. You can get it on Art19. All of our stuff is also on YouTube and on Cincy Jungle. And if you are joining us uh, a little late since we started, um, we, we did announce earlier we'll have a couple of neat interviews over the next uh, week and a half or so on our on our feeds. And uh, if you're able to join us live, please do. But uh, wide receiver Tyler Boyd will be joining us later this week. And then we'll have uh, running back Mark, Mark Walton joining us later. Uh, next week so that'll be pretty fun and uh we look forward to uh speaking with them and getting those interviews to you john is it time to to rip me a new one i mean i don't i don't know man you got you you got pretty heated after something i put out there i i I wouldn't say heated i i feel like (laughs) i feel like you just lobbed me like a a softball and i just kind of ran with ran with a possible joke opportunity but let's go ahead and talk about this so it is possible you have yeah. like the Mr. Burns fingers going, by the way. You just I, did like I don't the Mr. references. I'm, I'm too, I might be really. Talking. You don't know. <laughs> it's the Simpsons. Oh my god. I know. Oh, oh, I, know what you, I know. I know exactly the picture. Yeah. I know Excellent. The yeah. I know yeah. Okay. The All right. All right. We'll give regardless, you a pass. I guess. Regardless, it is possible <laughs> that the Bengals may have interviewed someone that they don't want us to know about, or they just didn't announce generally, and that might have been a candidate that was looking at other opportunities. He might be still coaching. In a, for a team in the playoffs, or it could be someone that maybe Bengals fans may not enjoy right off the bat. My co-host Anthony uh, threw out a name t- uh, today. Uh, following news of the Broncos hiring Big Man Geo, Fan Geo was, I guess, competing with another candidate for that job, and his name is Mike Munchak. Now, Munchak was a guy who's the Steelers' offensive line coach at the moment, he was a guy that I think Dave Lapham, right when the head coaching search started, threw out as a possible candidate for the Bengals mm. job. Um, and yeah, my co-host Anthony mentioned Munchak as a dark horse, and he immediately got ratioed on Twitter for, relative to his following. And <laughs> my initial thoughts on Munchak is that I can't get past the image of him tugging on Reggie Nelson's braids. And he yeah. kind of, he's kind of in that same boat with Joey Porter, whereas, you know, he might be good at his job, but he falls into a line of assistance that kind of had a little bit more freedom of their approach under Mike Tomlin and their maybe lack of control on the sideline. I don't know. I don't know a lot about Munchak and his uh, 
his way of doing things. His I know he produces very a very good offensive line in Pittsburgh. He's developed a lot of quality players there. He is an offensive mind, and that's the that's like the that's the buzz going around Cincinnati's potential hiring. He's just not the innovative offensive mind that I think a lot of people want. And he's a Steelers head coach, or he's a Steelers assistant coach under Mike Tomlin. So I understand that there would be a lot of pushback for Munchak, but I do think that he's an okay candidate if you can get past his past uh, experience as a head coach under the Titans where they were extremely mediocre under him, but he ended up turning into becoming a good offensive line coach. And if you were to replace him, if you were to pl- replace Frank Ra- or Frank po- Frank Pollock with Mike Munchak, I would accept that. I wouldn't go as far as making Munchak the head coach, but I do think that if there w- would be a dark horse candidate, that the Bengals have not announced that is an offensive mind. I guess Munchak would still fall into that because he's still kind of looking for work and he's still, I guess, extremely picky about picking the job over the job that he has now. Yeah. And the reason for, let me, let me just, let me just qualify my, my tweet here. Okay. I, by, by saying dark horse, that's not necessarily saying that that's the guy I, I want for the, for the Bengals to, to hire. Um, I think there probably are a couple of candidates that may outweigh him in terms of uh, quality and and what they can bring. You mentioned the stint in Tennessee that went. Eh. Was that was that the Jake Locker era? I, I think that's is that right around that. It went? probably was like early. Yeah, 20. yeah. So I, you know, I, I there's a, there's some stuff there that is leaves to be desired. Obviously, the thing with Reggie Nelson. But here's here's my thing. We've heard the rumblings of outside hire and offensive minded. Now we'll see if that actually comes to fruition or not. But I've said this a lot. The Bengals need to be borderline obsessed with beating the Steelers going forward. Uh, whether that's emulating them, whether that's being the bigger, bigger bully or whatever. Um, I, 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 they need to, that's a team you need to routinely beat in order to win the division, get in the playoffs, get through the playoffs. That's just how it is. That team is, however much you want to hate them. Uh, a lot of that hate probably stems from envy because they are very good. They are routinely in the hunt for a Super Bowl, And, uh, oftentimes it's at the Bengals expense. Munchak is a Hall of Famer as a player, pretty good position coach, offensive mind, and he comes from the Steelers. That's a guy who may be able, because if you remember, Mike Brown, when he hung on to Marvin Lewis as long as he did, he pointed to examples in Pittsburgh that this was a team, Pittsburgh is a team that has kept head coaches for a very long time for the stability purposes, and it's done them well. Well, not if he's looking that way at the Steelers, and he brings in Munchak. Maybe Munchak is a guy that could grab Brown's ear and say, "Look, this is how they do things over there. Uh, you know, this is this is the right way to do things. This is how you build a contender. Um, your practices aren't aren't the same way. Uh, I, I don't know. There's just things there that kind of intrigue me a little bit." Yeah, he's a retread. Yeah, he didn't have a, a success in, in Tennessee, but. I don't know. He's he's kind of as big of a roll of a dice as some of these other guys are interviewing in my eyes. That what you just talked about, what you just referred to, it reminded me a lot of Todd Haley's conversations with Hugh Jackson, where he was talking about players sitting. This is in Hard Knocks. He was talking about players uh, sitting out of practice when they probably shouldn't be, and how he was obviously referring to how they did things in Pittsburgh, and then that started the whole power struggle there. I'm not I'm not saying that it would be a bad thing. It was just something that reminds me of it. But also, <clears> I, I think an interesting point is. That we need that we need to start probably having discourse about is that looking three to five years into the future, do we honestly see the Steelers as the gold standard in the AFC North? Because obviously the Bengals haven't proven to beat them, and that that that's clearly true. I don't even think the Steelers look at the Bengals as their true rivals of the division. I think that's more Baltimore in their eyes, even though the Bengals have this disdain for them. That's clearly and obviously envy. But three to five years in the future. I think this is the Browns and Ravens division as of now mm. because of the success that they've had this year with, you know, their quarterbacks set up. Ben Roethlisberger is entering his late thirties. You know, who knows when he'll finally, you know, step down the multiple controversies that the Steelers have had 
just in the past two weeks, obviously speak volumes about their current power structure and how, what the issues that they're dealing with, but they don't have right now a long-term future to match both the Browns and Ravens. So while I understand that the Bengals need to find a competitive edge over the Steelers, they also need to be forward thinking that they're not the true team that we should be worried about going forward. And like they need to beat them now, but they need to be more concerned about the Browns and Ravens going forward. And I don't know if that's, you know, I don't know if that needs to require the, the same approach that you're re referencing with matching the Steelers, but I also think that, you know, the, in this era, in the Marvin Lewis era, the, the Bengals could never match the Steelers, but in the post Marvin Lewis era, maybe they need to be focusing more on the Browns and Ravens because they're set up better and greater than the Steelers are at this moment. I, that's a, that's a fantastic point. Uh, you know, because there's, with the rookie quarterbacks, because Baker Mayfield, everybody's on the Baker train, everybody's on the Lamar Jackson train, even though Lamar Jackson didn't play very well in that playoff loss against the Chargers. Um, you know, everybody's on that train. Now, we'll see if there's a second-year slump and if it was kind of a flash-in-the-pan thing. Uh, I see that happening more likely for Lamar Jackson than Baker Mayfield, personally, just because of the offensive system and all of that. But uh, we'll see. I mean, yeah, they're, they're kind of trending up because of those young signal callers and uh, the Ravens, even though Flacco isn't Ben Roethlisberger necessarily, um, they made a wise decision to say, you know, that he's not getting any younger and uh, the, the arrow for him has been pointing down a bit. Uh, maybe we need to move, make a move for Jackson and they did and, you know, it worked out for him. But I've said this before about the Steelers. Number one, I, I'm never going to count them out just because they have been so good and so for so long. Yeah, it's it, they'll have their lulls, um, and we can look at this this season being a mess. You know, they we can look. At, I think that what they finished eight, seven, and one was the mm -hmm. was what they ended up finishing. So I think they've never had a losing season under Mike Tomlin is one thing. So you know, and that's that's with Ben. I get it. Um, and Ben Roethlisberger probably is going to be playing very long, but the way that organization is run, I, I have a hard time counting them out. I said this kind of tongue in cheek a long time ago on this show, John, and I, I think you were, it was when you were part of it was basically the Bengals need to hope for kind of a, <laughs> a Mike, a, a Mark Malone, Mike Tomzak era, uh, which is before your time and sort of before mine, which is throughout the eighties. Uh, after the basically the post Terry Bradshaw era, pre Cordell Stewart era um, of Steelers football that was not very good. Uh, they still had some success, but definitely not to the level that they've had under Roethlisberger and and uh, whatnot. So uh, I, I just I, I hesitate counting them out, but you're right. I do see the arrow trending upwards for for Baltimore and and Cleveland for sure. I don't even I don't even think Steelers fans remember the '80s. It's like the polar opposite of the Bengals organization. Like the like the eighties were the Bengals like high top and the Steelers like bottom of the barrel. And ever since then, they've just been in opposite directions. It's so weird. It's well, it's selective memory, dude. And yeah. that's uh, you know when they when they yell Sixburg in your face, they, they they think about Terry Bradshaw and they think about Ben. And, uh, not mm -hmm. very much in between. The big gap in the Reagan era, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. For sure. Uh, what are what are your thoughts on uh, Mike Munchak? Uh, I, I, I'm looking through some of the uh, Sharif Willis says Mike Munchak is old as dirt. The team said young and offensive minded. All right. Uh, Nathan McGuire says I think they're uh, they're back up. They'll be good long term. Talking about the Steelers. Um, He's not talking about Mason Rudolph, is he? Uh, someone did talk about Mason Rudolph. Uh, I think, I think that was Nathan McGuire that said N Mason Rudolph. Yeah. I, I, I don't know about him. Yeah, maybe. Um, uh, really good college quarterback, but I don't, I don't know if he fits the pros. Uh, talking about Munchak, Tom Brooks says he fixed the Steelers line and made Ben not retire. Yeah, that's one, that's one thing. Michael Meyer says, I would say the Ravens are right, are the rivals and, and the Bengals are just hated, I guess, in terms of, uh, referring to the Steelers. So, um, and then Peter Nephis, uh, I don't know if he's agreeing with me or someone else in the chat room, but he says, good point. It would weaken the Steelers. So, um, look, Munchak, I think we both agree, Johnny, wouldn't be the worst hire. He would be unexpected. Um, maybe not the modern type of approach, um, 
Um, but I think there are there is some value there, at least um, from the Steelers' approach standpoint, and and what he could bring to the to the team. Obviously, you know, a story pass, all that kind of stuff. That's kind of where I was coming from, man. That's it. I get it. I get it. But it, I'll I'll never pass up on the on the opportunity like that ever again. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to, yeah, yeah. By the way, there was there were some tweets that came at me. Uh, this this was a good one uh, at Bengals Anon or Anon. Uh, it just it's a three word tweet that says "kick his ass" because uh, you because you said you were going to fight me on this on the show tonight. I can, I can only ass. fight Anthony on online because I couldn't beat him up in real life. I think it's just like <laughs> a lot of a lot of size on me. Unfortunately. Nah, nah, nah. I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not very tall and, and big in stature. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm a lover, not a fighter, my friend. So you're all good. This is this is the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast. He's John Sheeran. I'm Anthony Cazenza. We're happy to have you with us. We're going to talk about some more things uh, here coming up. And uh, we'll be taking, hopefully, some listener questions at the end. We've already got a couple teed up. But uh, you can still get at us, 949-542-6241. You can get this show on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Google Play, on Art19. Uh, it's also on YouTube, and all of our material is on Cincy Jungle, including our upcoming interviews with Tyler Boyd and Mark Walton over the next couple of weeks. So check that out. We're going to play a little game, John. Uh, and we can we could go back and forth on this if you want to rapid fire it. Uh, it's kind of our first time doing this, so we'll see, we'll see how this goes. But with these names of the coaches that are uh, – part of the interview process for the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, we're going to play a one word game. So uh, I guess you want to start with the outside guys. Yeah, let's do, let's do that. Okay. Let's start positive. <laughs> positive. Okay. Uh, Shane Waldron. Shane Waldron is intriguing. And uh, intriguing is the word. Okay. Because it's only one word. I would probably expand beyond that because pass game coordinator under Sean McVay essentially means offensive coordinator because McVay had an offensive coordinator, Matt LaFleur, who I guess didn't really call plays. He was just kind of there as his assistant. He's kind of like the Eric B enemy in, in Los Angeles. But Waldron was promoted to that role this year. The Rams obviously were an explosive offense. Waldron doesn't have the experience that the other candidates do, but he's intriguing in the sense that, you know, what he learned from McVay, and this is all, almost similar to another guy that we're going to talk about. It, it, it's intriguing to say the least, and at least, you know, it, it, it could wake me up from other candidates that they may have brought in. So I was at least intrigued by Waldron. Intriguing. Okay. I'll say uh, brainy. Uh, that It shows that the Bengals are looking at guys that know the nuances of, of, you know, passing the football. They, you know, this has long been a conservative franchise and uh, to, to see them kind of pay attention to, where the trends are going in the league and trying to kind of stay with, I don't want to say ahead of the curve because they're, you know, they kind of have been behind with Marvin, I guess a little bit, but uh, to try and stay with the trends and move towards that. Um, that's, uh, that's what I, that's what I would use, I guess, uh, in terms of a Waldron hire brainy uh, is, is my word. All right. So let's, let's stick with the team of uh, Zach Taylor. That's a good one. Uh, I will say potential. Uh, I, I think, and, and that's that's a lot of times potential is uh, it's a positive word, uh, and I, I want to mean that positively in terms of Taylor. But that you know, again, these the young guys kind of teams get in this you know hysteria of finding you know you saw. Kingsbury go to uh, the Cardinals as their head coach. So teams kind of get in this hysteria to find this next guy. Um, and it, it unfortunately got to kiss a lot of frogs along the way. So, uh, but I think the potential is high there. And I think that he could be a guy that could raise the level of an Andy Dalton or bring in an, a nice quality young guy and, and, and move that. So I'll say potential. All right. I, I like that. It's kind of where I was going. I'll, I'll go with whisper. As in quarterback Ooh. whisperer, um, yeah. Justice Muscada of Optimum Scouting, definitely check him out on Twitter at, at J U M O S K. Does a lot of an, uh, analytical and statistics work. He uh, actually measured like the sixty-seven um, different coaches in the NFL that 
influence quarterback play and how the, how efficient they are compared to uh, uh, you know d- the defense that they ended up playing. Zach Taylor ended up ranking in the top half of the sixty four. Mm. I think at like thirty two or thirty three or whatever. It wasn't it wasn't tremendous, but this is his first year in Los Angeles. Uh, you know, w- working specifically with Jared Goff as the quarterbacks coach. Before that, he was with Miami when Ryan Tannehill kind of elevated his game up until it plateaued once he got paid. He went to a, since, uh, the University of Cincinnati in 2016, was their offensive coordinator. Didn't have a lot to work with there because Tom Tupper, Tupperville was a crappy head coach and didn't have a quarterback recruit at, uh, of that season. But he, ha- he has a lot of work with quarterbacks, and I think that the whole point right now is to get the most out of Andy Dalton for the next two years before they end up moving on. So I think Taylor was one of those first guys that they looked to as how do we elevate our quarterback and you know, does this guy have the proper experience to, to get the most out of a quarterback who may be limited? All right, well, let's, uh, let's move on to who oh, I'm, I'm tempted to go. Let, let's, let's go to Todd Monken. Todd Monken, my, my word's ideal because I think mm. out, out of the four external, I think he's barely, not, not barely, but he, in my opinion, is the most well-fitted for what the situation is right now in terms of elevating an entire offense that has needed to be elevated since – Hugh Jackson's one season in 2015 where they ended up reaching heights that they haven't reached since 2005. But the problem with the Bengals, you know, the defense has always been kind of there up until this past season when it was historically bad. The offense, the the general theme of the Marvel Lewis is that mostly their offenses have underwhelmed compared to the talent that's there. And I think Monken's specialty is just getting, like like Taylor's quarterbacks, getting the most out of the talent that he brings in, that he develops. And he's proven that at Southern Miss. He's now proven that with Tampa Bay, at least in the passing game, if you can give him more, like we talked about, talent in the run in the run game and just the overall offensive line i think that he can produce solid results and i think he would connect with players at, at the right level because you know people from tampa bay you know had positive things to say about the, the, the kind of ke- the kind of chemistry that he had with players i think just his o- overall past experience would work best with the situation that they have now and plus when you have a guy who's an offensive mind like that Promoting him to head coach is ideal because then you already have him there and he can't leapfrog to another head coaching opportunity. So I think ideal would be the best word. Ideal. Okay. So I'll say I'm going to kind of play on yours. I'm going to say safe. And I, and, I, and I don't mean that in a you know uh, conservative play. I mean, it, it, it would be a forward thinking hire, but I think safe in terms of you said it, he's, he's a, a pretty solid fit for what they have and what they want to do, I think. So um, from that standpoint, I think the hire itself is safe now. I don't know if he would be the guy to ever lead them to a Super Bowl, maybe, but uh, I think he would at least kind of be a guy, maybe, to make things pretty interesting, pretty fun. Um, maybe get that, you know, maybe have this team kind of at that Marvin level of the eight to ten win range, oftentimes, and and have him there by throwing the football quite a bit and putting up a lot of points. So I'll say safe. All right, and let's finish it off with the enemy. Frenzied. Uh, and I use frenzied because, John, you put up a very interesting article about the pasts of Vance Joseph and Eric Bieniemy. Uh, I mentioned last week Bieniemy was an animal in the weight room. He plays a position that's just kind of, you got to kind of have a certain mentality with it. Um, he was He always played bigger than his size as a player. Uh, and then you look at the Chiefs offense, and it is just crazy. Um, mm. And I think a lot of that is Mahomes and him doing no-look passes and sidearm jump passes and all this stuff that you see MLB shortstops do. But, uh, you know, I think also the usage of all these different play players, the, the usage of a bunch of different plays and formations, it's just crazy, but crazy in a good way. I, I'll say frenzied is my word for enemy. All right, I'll go with charming. And I say charming as in he's the guy that not only, in my opinion, would be the most likely that they hire, but because he would be the guy that connects with Mike Brown on a personal level, similar to the way that Marvin Lewis did. And I think that's important in terms of adding influence into their operations and how they do things and getting control of a roster and getting control Mm. of staff, uh, of staff uh, decision-making and all that kind of stuff and putting together just a team that could compete. And I think that's extremely important and maybe – Want, maybe something that none of the other candidates could could do that are also qualified and not the internal ones. But the enemy obviously played here. He you know he he comes from a big quality coaching tree, and I think Mike obviously obviously likes that. And we have to remember that when Marvin Lewis came from here, you know he had the 
he had the respect of being the defensive coordinator for a Super Bowl team. He obviously had that one year in Washington, but you, you had to think that Mike liked where he came from. And I think that he thinks of Binnemi in a similar way where he comes from a successful organization that does things the right way and comes comes from a, a good quality head coach that kind of oversaw his development as a coach. And, and I think that just from just all those other points that Binnemi would probably connect with Mike He's now 83 years old, the, the best in, in terms of handing over power to a new head coach that isn't Marvin Lewis. Yep. Yeah. And uh, you could also go with Berman, Berman you know, Chris Berman, sleeping with the enemy. Uh, he came <laughs> up with a, a fun nickname for him. That would be a good word. Uh, do we do we want to do the inside, guys? If, if you really want to. Uh, sure. All right. Let's do it. Let's 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 start with Darren Simmons. I, I, let's go. With, let's go with boring, because I think. And, you know, I, I don't think Simmons is a bad coach, but I guess out of the internal ones, he was like the shiniest of turds, in my opinion. Because I think <laughs> it's more about who comes in as his coordinators than just him being the head coach. Because obviously, I don't think he would have play calling duties as the offensive or defensive guy. Special team coordinators in the past have shown to be have shown to become quality head coaches. Harbaugh and Belichick are just a, a few, you know, outlier examples, obviously. But they obviously have a lot of experience with dealing with a, a, a macro approach about a, a whole entire unit and special teams is very integral in that. But Simmons has been here for a long time. And, you know, we talked about, we want to eliminate the, 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 you know, the Marvin Lewis guys, but in Simmons definitely qualifies as that because he's been here as long as Lewis has, but I think Simmons would be okay. Just as that head coach figure, as long as his coordinators are fine, but nothing about Simmons excites me. And that's why I think he's kind of boring. I'll say Marvin. Because he was a Mar- he was a Marvin guy came in with Marvin, um, was a guy that rebuilt a really really poor special teams unit the year before, um, and made it. You know, you had I think Shane Graham at one point made a Pro Bowl, and you had a couple of special teams Pro Bowlers from his unit, but it still wasn't the standout. You know, I mean, not special teams isn't talked about as much as other units anyway, but it's, I don't think it was the, sh- the shining beacon of NFL special teams units. It was just always pretty good. Yeah. Um, so I, I think he solidified things in that, in his unit, just like Marvin did turmoil made the team competitive. I think he's kind of of the Marvin tree. I, I that's the word I would use is Marvin. All right. Now let's go with uh, Vance Joseph. Yeah, I guess we should have started with that one, right? Uh, because he's he's kind of like we said, he's kind of the bridge guy. He was the outside guy. And, um, oh man, Vance. Uh, I'll say unknown because, and that might be a little bit of a cop out, but I, to be honest, some people believe he didn't really get a fair shake in Denver. He wasn't really given a great quarterback in Denver, um, but. There were signs that he was losing that team um, both years. Just, you know, they had a great defense, and they just didn't really – there was no kind of pizzazz with that team, I guess. It just was kind of a a, a decent team at times, and I don't know. Uh, So uh, unknown. The the other thing on the positive side, I remember a specific comment from Drake Kirkpatrick when Vance Joseph was here. He called him the best coach he has ever played for, ever. Um, so, yeah, people are down on Drake Kirkpatrick and, and some of his recent seasons, but it's a pretty big, it's a pretty big statement about a coach. So, uh, I will say unknown about Vance Joseph. All right, and I'll go with intermediary. And I've had this sentiment since Marvin got fired. I feel like, and I, this is something I, I tweeted out uh, just this is past week. I feel like the entire Bengals fan base formed like this in, in unison, unison, like a giant, like anti Hugh Jackson movement. And at some point, I think the Bengals brass kind of heard that to an extent. And they realized that if they hired Hugh, that they would experience, you know, a lot of boycotts and whatever. And I feel like they look at Vance as that intermediary option where it's not Hugh, but it's not someone completely new that we may not trust off, off the surface. So it's kind of like that in between option that maybe not, neither side actually once, but kind of feels like it's like a safe middle of the road choice where it's a guy that they know that it's a guy that's been in the building that they can trust to do things in the way that they want to do. But at the same time, it's not the worst possible scenario, even though Vance Joseph as a head coach hasn't shown to work out. And like you said, he didn't have the best case in Denver, but I think he has extremely similar qualities in terms of in-game decision-making to a Marvin Lewis or to a Hugh Jackson, but he's not 
either of those guys. So he's kind of just in that purgatory area. That's just not what the Bengals need, I guess. Yeah. Yep. And just a, a side note to uh, take a slight break from the, our little game here. Um, Ian Rappaport a, an hour ago. Uh, so er, before we took the air, Adam, Adam Gase was announced as the Jets new head coach. Um, uh, Ian Rappaport shortly before we got on the air uh, on Wednesday evening said one strong possibility as defensive coordinator coordinator for the uh, new Jets coach Adam Gase is Vance Joseph. Joseph is still in the mix with the Bengals, but he could land with the Jets if Cincinnati doesn't work out. Gase and Joseph were together in Miami, so uh, that would be a, a logical fit there on a lot of different fronts. But uh, oh boy, I'm going to do it to you, Hugh. Oh, I thought we were saying that. For, all right, fine. Uh, no, 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 I'll, I'll save it for last. Let's let's do uh, who is the other laser? Let's do laser? laser. I'll just go with underwhelming because I think at the start, people kind of liked what laser brought just from an approach because I think he was kind of seen as a as a pushy guy to maybe Andy Dahl and to kind of get him out of his comfort zone. And at the start, you know, it was kind of all right because he was going from Kane Zampezi, which was at the bottom of the bottom. I ended up getting some production in 2017, but he didn't progress, I think, at the level that a lot of people wanted him as a play caller. And I only just see him as this below-average play caller that wouldn't provide any upside or any inspiration towards his players and to the Cincinnati Bengals in general. And I think just promoting him to head coach after another underwhelming season of leading the offense is just it's just extremely underwhelming. And I'll just use, use the word again. And they can do so much better, but, you know, if we didn't hear the reports that we're hearing now, it wouldn't really surprise us because it's the guy that, that, that they know and they think that they had success with, even though relatively they didn't. Yeah, I'll say disaster. I, that's that's he's he's the guy I want the least. And uh, a little spoiler alert for the next coach we're going to talk <laughs> about, but he would be the he would be the higher I would dislike the most. Um, yeah, he has had some raw deals in terms of injuries on his staff. Yeah, he took over a shattered offense from Ken Zampezi a few games in last year, but his unit still finished dead last in, in yards per yards per game last year, dead last, and they finished 26th in the category this year. Um, and, uh, I mean... Uh, you, there's complaints about him abandoning Joe Mixon at the wrong times. There, there's just, I, to me, that would be the worst hire. Um, I think I looked on his resume. I don't think he has any head coaching experience. Um, it's basically grad assistant and assistants all the way up to NFL level. So um, at least with some of these other guys that Joseph and Jackson, they have a little bit of head coaching experience, maybe could learn from some of their mistakes in previous stints. Whereas laser, I think would be an unmitigated, unmitigated disaster. Yeah. So I guess now Hugh. Circus. Uh, I, and I think I say that in a lot of different ways. I think Jackson is an entertaining interview at times. Uh, he's a, he's, he can be a charismatic guy, but he can also be a guy that burns bridges. We saw that on his way out of Cleveland. Um, we've seen him do some crazy things with the Bengals offense and a lot of pieces and, and a lot of pieces that are still here that 2015 season. If you remember, they did stuff where they were splitting Whitworth way out and doing three linemen in the middle and doing all kinds of crazy fun stuff. Um, there's an element that he could end up shocking everybody and end up being actually a, a good, a solid coach uh, after stints in Oakland and in Cleveland that didn't work out. Um, maybe he gets more out of Dalton. Maybe he brings in a new guy. Um, but it's also going to be a circus in terms of fan unrest, fan mutiny if he gets hired. Because from what I've read on – Twitter and comments and all kinds of stuff. That is the guy that most people do not want. So um, I would say circus is what I would use to describe Hugh Jackson being hired by the Bengals. Yeah, I'm just going to say no. Because I think <laughs> it's like no, there's no simpler phrase than just no. It's so defined and clear and so, you know, so right to the point. Whereas there is, in, you know, there is justification to hire a Hugh Jackson, but any justification that you would throw out is immediately outweighed by the obvious and clear disadvantages of hiring Hugh Jackson, otherwise known as the worst NFL head coach since the 1970 merger. Only one head coach in NFL history 
has a worse winning percentage than him. It's Bert, his Bert Jones, I think is his name. He coached like the thirties and forties for, I don't even know what team. It probably doesn't even exist anymore. Hugh Jackson is the gold center of, or not, not the gold center. He's the, he, he's the worst. Like there, there, there is nothing worse. And I know people give him excuses because he, because he did this in Cleveland who at the time was a dumpster fire, but Nobody wants to mention that once you left, it became from a dumpster fire to an ascending team that, f- that finished the year above 500 after he left. He, he's, he's a plague. Like everywhere he goes from now on will just be considered worse. And he's just the, he's just the one parasite that kind of takes more than what he gives. And, and, I, and I understand that there, there, there is connections here. I know there's, there's, there's comfort with the roster and, and, the, and the management that's in place here. But none of it outweighs the the potential disaster that, that could come of it, and that would likely come of it. And it would just be, you know, it was our biggest fear when Marvin was fired. But now, the more the time has passed, the you know, the, the less we fear. But it's still, I guess, in the air. And the, my the sentiments haven't changed about it, though. Just no. So I think that's everybody, right? Do we uh, do we yeah. cover the eight? Okay, they, and we're not going to go in, in Munchak. We're not going to go some some other potentials that we don't know about yet. But uh, that's our fun little one word game that we like to play. Uh, maybe we'll do that again at some point uh, going forward. Uh, maybe in the after the draft or free agency acquisitions or something. That was fun. Um, just some additional comments from some people in the live YouTube chat. Um, Vignesh Arasu says uh, Vance Joseph doesn't have the it factor that is needed to be a great coach. I think he's a great coordinator, but not a coach, not a head coach. Uh, and by the way, Vignesh said it was his, I think it was his or her first time in the, the live YouTube chat. So um, thank you for joining us. Uh, Michael Myers laser is garbage. Uh, that's the word he used there. Um, 25 lighter says if Hugh Jackson gets hired, that's my final straw. Uh, S Franco really liked, uh, my circus where uh, word for, for Hugh, whereas Brandon bachelors laughed at your nope, uh, for, for Hugh. So, um, yeah, a lot of interesting candidates, a lot of in- strong opinions, I think, for each one of these, and we welcome yours. There's going to be a lot to talk about over the next couple of weeks here as uh, not only the head coach is is hired, but uh, the ensuing staff as well. This is the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast. He's John Sheeran. I'm Anthony Kazenzi. You can get this show on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play. You can get it on YouTube. You can get it on Art19 and on Cincy Jungle. Get it how you can. We've got a lot of good material coming up uh, as well as our normal show. So so please check it out. Keep keep tuned to us. We uh, we appreciate all of the support. And there's been a lot of new listeners, it seems like, in the, in the live broadcast, which is awesome as well. We're going to get out of here with uh, listener questions. We're going to – I've already got one teed up. We're going to try and – Maybe take one more beyond that. You can give us a call or shoot us a text, uh, 949-542-6241. I think I know who this is. This is the Orange and Black Insider. Who's this? Hey, Terrell. Terrell. Yes, <laughs> Terrell. Oh, we, we, thought, we thought we had somebody else, but uh, – Well, John out, thought. You're going out of order, man. You go after yeah, that. I know John. Uh, John uh, thought it was somebody else on the line, but we are happy to have you, sir. Uh, we're going to get to our game in just a second here. But uh, what what can we what can we answer for you tonight, buddy? Uh, basically, uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking I got three theories of, of a head coach, maybe two things around that too. But I uh, I basically think that the Bengals uh, waiting for Eric uh, Bieniemy to get on with uh, yeah. Dane this weekend. Oh yeah, Monken, yeah.
Exactly. He's gonna stay in the AFC because he wanna he wanna get revenge on the Steelers and he wanna Ooh. stay up on us. That would that would not be good. Thanks for the call, Terrell. Interesting stuff, and and I think a lot of us are in in agreement uh, with you in terms of the Bengals are probably. I, I think common sense tells you they're probably waiting for one of these guys. Thanks for the call, by the way, Terrell. Uh, that they're they're waiting for one of these guys for this weekend to pass. I mean, I think that's kind of what we're thinking, right, John? Yeah, I think best case scenario would be for them at least that the Colts and the Cowboys win, so the the Chiefs and the Rams are out of the playoffs, and they can, I guess, make that decision final as quick as possible. But yeah. it's probably not going to happen. So I guess we're just going to be left in the dark for a little bit longer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think the enemy's probably at wet at one of the top of the list. But what do you think about what he just said about Le'Veon Bell? I didn't think about that. He said, uh, the, Ravens. A lot of, he said the Ravens. A lot of people think he might go to the Colts. I think I think the bridge is burned, obviously for Pittsburgh. I don't think that's that's happening again. And then obviously Pittsburgh pr- uh, proved this year that they can run the ball with basically anybody. Uh, Connor and then the other the other kid that they had uh, ended up having a I think a hundred yard game for him as well at some point. So I mean they can there that's kind of plug and play there. But what do you think about Bell and, and the Ravens? That's interesting. That'd be such a pity signing because he would obviously get more opportunity and more money with the Colts because they have, I think, 120 in cap space and they have a proven offensive line and mind to work with. And even if, you know, Marlon Mack is ascending there, I'm, I'm sure Reich and Frank Reich could get the most out of both of them and, you know, make him worth his money. But going to the Ravens would be such like such an in-your-face kind of thing because I don't think they can pay him what the Colts can and I think their backfield is pretty much set as well with, with what they have and how he would work with Lamar Jackson would, would be extremely interesting. But they all, he, he would just be going there to prove a point, I guess. And I have to, I guess, respect that if he decides to do it. But if this whole thing was about him getting the biggest bag, I don't know why going into Baltimore would be the answer to that. It would, it would simply be to stick it to, to the Steelers yeah. twice a year and, and potentially the Bengals. So like, just like Terrell said, that's, but that would, that would not be good. I would just like to see him just, Get out of the division. Just you know, I don't. I don't think the Bengals need to face him twice a year. Uh, we could have de- we could have talked about this one when we talked about Mike Munchak, I guess, John. But uh, we got a text earlier in the program from. Let me see the area code um, from five one three. Well, that's Cincinnati area code, so. <laughs> Shocker, uh, but uh, I didn't get the name of the of the person, unfortunately. But um, just two words and a question mark. Greg Williams. Meh. Uh, I I don't really have a strong opinion on this because, like, I, I think he's funny as a meme, and like I, I like I kind of like to pretend that he's not like an actual person. He's just kind of like an alien alien kind of figure that just says random football things from here and then. But he did surprise me in Cleveland and and how. You know, players rallied behind him and how he was able to effectively utilize and elevate that defense to the level that it should have performed because there was a lot of raw talent on that defense and he ended up making it work. And it was, it was again, a strong unit after it was 2017. So, um, you know, I, I think Cleveland handled the situation perfectly in hiring Kitchens and letting Kitchens pick his own staff and clearing out most of that staff, which one of them ended up being Ken Zampese, the quarterback coach. But yeah, I, I think that, that Williams will probably find another job because of the job they did. I think he's like the third winningest coach in Browns history in terms of winning percentage after going like five and three. So, Crazy. I, so like I, I think I, I think he does still have a future in this league, but I you know, if if the new head coach likes him at defensive coordinator, then I guess, you know, there, there's reason to support that. But I guess he's not my first choice. But he has he did surprise me this year and he, 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 he's now considered a person in my eyes and not just some figment of my imagination. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, for, for head coach right now, I'd kind of say, let's, let's, no, definitely not go, head coach. yeah, I'd say let's maybe go a different direction, but uh, for defensive coordinator, I, I would be on board with that. Um, especially because of, like you said, how the Browns rallied around him, some of the things that the Browns were able to do. And, and, you know, he collected some talent there on that Browns defense and he made it work. Um, there, there's, you know, there, there are some talented, talented players and young, talented players on that defense that the Bengals will have to deal with for a long time. Miles Garrett, Denzel Ward. Uh, I mean, the list kind of goes, goes on and on. Um, I think, 
I don't know how old he is, but uh, Schobert, the linebacker, he he seems to make some plays a, a lot as well. He's he's a decent player, so um, you know a lot, a lot of a lot of good pieces on that defense, and Greg Williams probably not only helped bring those pieces in, but also groom them into productive NFL players. We're gonna get out of here with with this one. It's kind of a tag team question from two people in our live YouTube chat. This this question normally I wouldn't answer at this time of year, but I think it's pertinent because the Bengals are now searching for a new head coach. And I think the discussion kind of needs to be had. This will probably change after free agency, but um, Vigna Shirasu says, what position do you think the Bengals should draft in the first round this year? And Peter Nefa says, should they use the first round pick for a quarterback understudy for a year? Is that the way to go? Um, your thoughts there very early in the process here, John. Um, I think at the moment there's like one clear quarterback that you would want to sit behind Dalton for a year to then take over. I think that's Haskins. And I don't think that they'll be able to get Haskins unless they trade up. And right for, for the Bengals that we know, at least that that's not a likely possibility. Um, as our own Matt Minich said, you know, it doesn't have to be a great quarterback class. There just has to be a great quarterback period for your team. And honestly, it's, it's still a little bit early to clearly say that with any with any conviction because there is some intriguing names, but there's not a lot of guys that the data in terms of predicting quarterback success really supports besides Haskins. But yeah, it, it, if they're you know they, they could pull a Bills and just you know defy you know conventional thinking, and if they truly you know buy into a guy, then then yeah. then they have a plan, and at least you can kind of rally behind that. But as far as right now, the position that they should look at, I think it has to be either. Uh, offensive tackle or linebacker. I think th there has to be a certain time where we just, you know, they just nail down the linebacker position in a, in a true manner, whether that's an actual free agent signing to a multi-year deal or just go out and get a guy who's a clear cut blue chip prospect. And maybe there's, the, maybe there's that guy in the draft and they got like Devin white from LSU. We don't even know if he's going to declare for the draft, but he would probably be that early favorite now. And if it's not linebacker, then maybe they shore up that right tackle spot because the, you know, at, at least they have some solidity along three positions on that line. Maybe they can get away with a bad guard if they, you know, a, a bad right guard, I should say, if they pair him up next to a competent right tackle. And I think if they find that guy at at, number, at 11th overall, then they should probably pull the trigger if they don't have a linebacker there. Yeah, and I think, um, see, from what I've read a little bit on the tackles uh, this year, it's not – there's not a bunch of strong ones. I mean, there's kind of some ones that are pretty good. I mean, even one of the guys, if you watch the national championship game, and by the way, we, we were going to talk about some of those players this week, but uh, that played in that game, but too much going on with the coaching stuff. But uh, if you looked at I, 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 his name escapes me at the moment, but they're starting left tackle. He was pegged as basically a top 15 pick this year. He kind of got thrown around. Oh, Jonah Williams. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, he got thrown around a little bit by the Clemson defensive line, which a lot of players do because that Clemson defensive line is insane. But um, you know, they, you know, maybe he's more serious a right tackle, whatever in the NFL. But uh, you know, that was a little disheartening. He's going to go up against as good, if not better, competition in the NFL. So that you know, that's not great. Um, so maybe at that point, maybe he's a little reach, a little bit of a reach at eleven, and then you say, well, then there's the Devin Devin White kid from LSU, and that position is sorely needed at linebacker. You see the effect Roquan Smith had on the Bears this year. Uh, uh, this kid from LSU is just like that. Um, he's he's probably a little bit more stocky, uh, a little bit more of the middle linebacker type, I think, but uh, can just make a lot of a lot of different plays, like a Roquan Smith. I really wanted Roquan Smith last year, mm -hmm. um, if the Bengals were able to grab him. But uh, so I, it, and it it depends on the coach. Personally, I'm kind of saying, well, you got your new head coach, you're going to have a new defensive coordinator. I think a lot of people want the move to quarterback, but maybe just after so much change. Maybe early on you you kind of go more a little more safe. Um, you kind of you know what Marvin did, even though he wasn't a head coach at the time. But what Marvin 
a new head coach. Uh, what Marvin did in 2011, they took the safest player in the draft in AJ Green at number four, and they just said, that's where we're going. Um, and maybe that's what they do this year. So I, I agree with you, John. I think offensive line or linebacker is probably the way to go. Depending on who they hire, though, if it's Biennemi or one of these uh, one of these guys from the Rams, maybe even Monken, I don't know. Um, they may they may be saying what they're selling is we're moving away from Dalton and we're we're doing something else, and uh, maybe that's enough for Mike Brown to go and say, okay, we'll give you the capital to go up and get a Haskins or something like that. We'll mm-hmm. see. Thanks for the questions, guys. We're, we're running a little late. We're running a little long. We started late tonight, unfortunately, but uh, we're, we're, we've got to get out of here for time purposes. Uh, you can keep your eyes and ears not only to this podcast, the Orange and Black Insider, on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, Cincy Jungle and Art 19, but you can also keep your eyes and ears to CincyJungle.com. Uh, we'll have all the updates, news, analysis. We're... Uh, I have to pat us on the back. We're pretty quick on the news front in terms of breaking news. And so uh, not only that, like I said, opinion analysis, all that good stuff. So keep it there as well. John, any final thoughts before we get out of here, sir? I just wanted to share the best thing that I saw today. Um, I think it was before the New Orleans Saints practice today. Um, Four, or it was actually yesterday, four armed guards entered the Saints locker room surrounding head coach Sean Payton as he wheeled in the Lombardi Trophy on top of $225,000 in cash. In cash. All the players right around him, and, and, and Peyton said, y'all want this? Win three effing games. And then the entire locker room erupted, because 225000 is the Super Bowl bonus for each player. And that tells me that the Saints are the Super Bowl. They're about to completely and utterly destroy Nick Foles. And I think rather than pretty much at the same level of likelihood. So... You know, you're not a believer in Nick Foles, oh, or at least not, at least not, at least not this week. You don't think he's got a miracle this week? Uh, I, I think the Eagles' best plan is to keep both of them and just have once injure himself in December, so then Foles can take over and win when it matters. Because I think that at this point, <laughs> that, that's like building a dynasty right now. Like, like yeah. no one, no one thought they'd beat Chicago, but Foles ended up playing just well enough with uh, behind that defense. Yeah, if we're if we're gonna go back and play the one word game, one word for Cody Parkey is doink. Um, so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, poor, poor, poor guy. Uh, I felt so bad for him. Um, that's just uh, anyway. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to top that. I don't really have too much to top that, my friend. Uh, it's, this has been a whirlwind episode. I think it's been a lot of fun. I guess, like I said, uh, I guess I keep promoting these, but it's because I'm I'm pretty excited that we are able to land these guys. Tyler Boyd and Mark Walton will be coming up here in the next couple of weeks. So check that out. We're going to try and get more as well. Uh, more Bengals players and, and coaches and whatnot on the program. Uh, I think I've got a pretty good conduit potentially built up to, to do that. So we'll see. But uh, we'll, thanks in advance for their time, and uh, we're excited to bring those guys to you. Thanks for tuning in. Get the program on the channels and avenues that we've said a number of times on the program. We'll keep you up to date on all things Bengals and their coaching search. So keep it here to the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast and to CincyJungle.com. For John Sheeran, I'm Anthony Kazenza. We'll see you next time. Ooh.